follow God, love people, change the city, right? And one of the ways that we can follow God is to follow what he said, what he said accurately, not what people say he said, not what they say on the street, not what people quote at the family reunions, but what God's word really say. Come on, why don't you come and be a part of TKC so that you can learn what Jesus actually taught or what the Bible actually says. Because all that other stuff that people say, that's not what he said. I, I want to get into this message this morning. It's a little different. It's, it's, we've been doing our series on that's not what he said. And this morning I want to read Matthew 6, verse number 24. Uh, you can write the note. It's going to be helpful for you to write some of these notes down. And I, I really, this morning, I want to challenge you to think a little differently. Um, this will cause you to live a little differently, but it will help you live, in my opinion, a Christ-centered life that may be a little different than culture and even a little different than what we hear in, in our local churches at times. Matthew 6, 24 says this. It says in the ESV, and they translated it the word money because most people didn't understand what the KJV said, which is the word mammon. But I want to I wanna re-interject the word mammon because it's important. It was different than money, even though it involved money. So we kind of lose the power of the word by saying money because everybody understands money. Most people don't understand mammon, but I do want to teach you what mammon is because it will help you understand about money. So Matthew 6, 24 says, no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, 1 Timothy 6.10, 1 Timothy 6.10 says this. This is what Paul says. The apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy is a pastor of a church in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus is a, is a new church. It's, it's a house church. It's not like a building like we think of today. It's a house church. And Paul is telling Timothy, listen, I want you to know that the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, most of us have heard money is the root of all evil. But if you drop a word out, it changes the context of the verse. First Timothy 6.10 doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And um, that, that's important. And so I want to highlight it's not a series on giving, so you could relax. We already did giving, so be, be easy. So this is going to help us. And you'll hear it in my introduction. This series, That's Not What God Says, has been one of my favorite to teach, I must admit. It allows me to merge culture and doctrine to produce well-rounded believers. This morning or evening, if you are watching the replay, one of the most controversial verses, because it's often misquoted, is money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, for the love of money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is amoral, but either it has, but either the end user is driven by the Spirit of God or this word, which we will soon understand, called mammon. I was sent a video this week, which I think every person should watch. It's called, um, by Pastor Jamal Bryant, I think it's something I ate. It's very unique, but he said one word in there that was the exactly... Um, the title of my message, it was this morning I want to talk about the gospel of contentment. Family, we live in a world driven by mammon and the old church was working so hard to stay away from money, they didn't amass much of it in efforts to preserve a version of holiness which involved or was synonymous to poverty. Now we have a generation of believers who want to be holy but don't want to be poor to prove it. I think you can have both. But culture has driven many of our prayers and our affections. It makes us get 
it makes us get a blessing and within moments want something else that's greater than the blessing we just got. We have a culture who gives more tips on success, how to get more, how to position ourselves for greater, all while using faith as a justification to make things spiritual. We strive for awards in the name of Jesus. I really want to drill the Bible was not written to Americans. We must address the appetite driven by mammon which doesn't allow us to be content. It has been said Americans move every seven years. Comparative to other parts of the world, one Africa which I visited, and they said most families move twice their entire life. One is not better, but the point is culture drives it. Maybe God did bless me with this 1,400 square foot home and made provision for me to pay it off in 10 years, but my appetite made me get a 4,400 square foot home. Now this is not condemnation for achievement, but it is introspection on what contentment looks like for you and me. I was watching a show which my wife and I love to watch. It's called Love It or List It. It's HGTV for those of you that pray all the time. Um, and in this particular show, there is a salesperson and a, de a decorator, and her job as a decorator is to get the people to stay in their home. The listing agent's job is to go out and show you an amazing home that meets everything that you could want and more and get you to sell your home. And for the life of me, I always get upset because it seems like everybody ends up loving their house as opposed to listing it. But then I started realizing the reason why I can be so perplexed by this is because we are driven subconsciously by this idea that bigger has to be better. And it removes the joy of being present because we always want more in the future. So I wanna, I wanna kinda help you understand this word in scripture that's not very much talked about, it's a word called covetous. Covetous is a Greek word, and it just simply means lusting for greater number of temporal things that go beyond what God determines is eternally best for you. So it's kind of hard to justify, I want eight cars in the name of Jesus. I don't think that it's wrong if you have the capacity to buy it, but we do have to internalize and ask ourselves the question, where does contentment fit in my journey of faith? It's a question everybody has to ask themselves. That just because I can doesn't mean I should. I was driving with this guy named Happy Feet. And um, we, we were talking about homes and he says, you know, I'm thinking about selling my home and, and downsizing to something smaller because I don't need all of this. And without him even knowing, it was confirmation to what I was preaching today that many of us are in financial calamity, not because God told us to pursue it, but our appetite drove us to it and we asked God to bless it. So here it is. Where did this word mammon come from? It, it actually started in the Tower of Babel in Genesis. Y'all remember when they were building the Tower of Babel and they were trying to get to heaven and, and they, they started climbing and, and God started recognizing that these people may actually be able to do it, that they may be able to pierce the heavens and get to the highest point because they were collectively together. And so what God did to, to cause them not to be able to do it, he destroyed their language. Now here's the first thing you need to understand. If you do business, if you do anything in the, in the marketplace or in life, you will recognize the reason why people can't grow together is because they stop speaking the same language. And even in communities where, where we're trying to figure out how to solve an issue, we're not saying the same thing because languages are mixed. That's why you see communities that are filled with uh, crime and everybody's trying to figure out what to do, but everybody's saying something different. Until we can say the same thing, you won't see change happen because every time we try to build something, someone changes the language. That's why language is important. I need to know what you mean when you say, I love you. 
because I love you is a word that's thrown around by everybody and it means different things to different people. I love you means I love you, uh, I love my job until they stop paying me. Amen. This, this is the best place until you disagree with it. So, so we need to define what language means. But mammon was something that was happening in the Tower of Babel when they were trying to build this ideology that, uh, here's just for context sake. So Babel means, Babylon means to Babel. The suffix on it, O-N, means sown. So it means that when they were trying to build the Tower of Babel, someone, God, sowed confusion in their midst. In any organization, you have to be careful of the Babylons. They see unity and all they do is sow their language of confusion. So they start by saying like, well, did they really mean that? Because they want to change language. Here's what the spirit of mammon did in that culture. Mammon also, y'all, now we can contemporize and bring you in. Mammon was a god of the Syrians. Now, here's what you need to know. There were many other gods in scripture. There were many other gods in culture. But there's only one big G God. There were many other kings. But there was only one king of kings. So there were many other people in the earth named Jesus when he was alive. But there was only one person's name, Jesus, that really mattered over them all. So here's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Mammon was a God that said this, if you get more of me, you'll have peace, you'll have joy, you'll have contentment, you'll have everything you need. Mammon is what culture presents to us today. If you get more of mammon, you're going to be happy. If you get more of mammon, you're going to have peace. And how many of us have worked three or four jobs to get this peace and never had it? We've sacrificed games for our kids to get more of this mammon. We've sacrificed being able to spend time with family to have this look that we were told would make us happy. Here's some things that you need to understand. Mammon and Tower of Babylon made them feel, number one, that they didn't need God. Mammon is trying to get you and I to believe that there's security in it, and if you get more mammon, you'll be safe. If I just get more mammon, I'm going to be totally safe. And if you and I are not careful, we can start to believe that mammon is our security. Number two, they believe that they can achieve this on their own effort. And many of us have dreams that we wrote down that we want to achieve on our own effort. And some of our dreams that we have, God's like, I didn't give you that. And some of our dreams, God is saying, you're going to pursue it and it's going to cause you to crash and burn because it's going to be more than you can handle in the season of maturity that you are in in your life. Number three, they believe they can achieve it not just on their own effort, but on their own work. That if I just keep working hard enough, I'm gonna get myself into this space where I'm totally happy, totally free, totally at peace. Number four, this is the most important one, because it happens to many people. They replaced worship with work. Because as a culture, it's hard to tell people that maybe you should be content with what God has already done. Because we live in a culture that tells you if you have more, you're winning. Well, may I suggest to some that maybe if you have more, you're actually losing. Because the reality is the more mortgage you have, the more debt you have, and the less likely you are to be able to do things you really want because you're more concerned about your mortgage than your ministry. 
When I say ministry, I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about whatever God has put in your life to be able to do. And some of us are on the brink of forfeiting it because you're making more income, you're doing more in life, and all of a sudden you're starting to get the itch to prove to others the hand of God is on you and you're deceiving yourself because the hand of God is already on you and even if you get something bigger, it doesn't remove what God has already done. Mammon is a spirit that drives us to say, this is not enough. There was one generation that just settled. Now we have another generation that's no longer settling, but they're saying, you know what? I want to have the block and own it. Well, the reality is, is the question we have to ask ourselves is, why do you want the block? Because we can play games all one. Now, I want to be balling so I can show how good God is. Some of us want to ball so that we can affirm the poor child that didn't have what we have today. And, and if you're not careful, you will end up getting into debt trying to prove something that God will say, man, your life could have been so much happier in a three bedroom than when you got the six bedroom. And now you gotta work extra. Now you gotta do all the additional things because you put yourself in a situation now that you can't get out of. And I was trying to show you how to find contentment in me and not the color of the bottom of your shoe. You know, I'm not trying to be political, but a lot of us are waiting for a political figure to save us because our debts got us into decisions. And I know, I know that's not what you tune in for because you wanted to hear that God wants to give you more. And the reality is, is that maybe God has already given you more, but you can't appreciate the more because you're looking at everybody else's more and you're defining your contentment based on what other people have. And you're losing what God really wants to do in your life because you're so enamored by what God is doing in others' lives. Mammon is a spirit that wants to rest on money. Mammon promises us status, significance, and a change of season. It's like, yo, if you get more of this, you're going to have a better life. And then there are people who spend their entire lives to get the better life to realize it's not the life they wanted. And it's even with cars. Some people, God has blessed them with a great car, and this doesn't mean you can't get what you want to get, but it does mean to know, like, when does contentment kick in and when does greed set in? So Mammon says this, I'm going to promise you status because <laughs> Mammon's job is to lure your appetite. Okay, let, let's, have you ever watched a commercial of, of a sandwich that looked really, really good on TV? And then you go order it and it doesn't taste nowhere near what it looked like on television? but it lured your appetite to which you said, you know what, I really want this. And then when you got it, you realize this really wasn't what I wanted. But that's what mammon does. It lures your appetite to think you want more and it makes you blind to what you already have. And then you don't realize that you're slipping further and further into being owned by somebody else. Because listen to this. Mammon's job is to control how you feel. Oh man, I didn't. Man, I just. Man, I ain't. I ain't doing what I thought I should be doing. Man, I, I, I need to. I need to. And then the the husband's like, man, I need. To, I need to. I need to be better. And the wife's like, you need to give me more. And the husband's like, I want to give you more. The husband's telling the wives, you need to give me more. Whatever the case is, and you're pushing each other into a race that you're not fast enough to keep up with. I know I lost 15 members in this big old church. But how many of you are swiping your card to prove to people who don't care that you're significant? 
after we see the bottom of your shoe, you're going to get, oh, you doing it and we're going to move on. After we see your belt buckle, you're going to get one clap and we're going to move on. It will not change your significance. It will give you a filtered reality. It will give you a false sense of what really is good. That is why a lot of people will spend all of their resources to buy a very nice expensive vehicle to pull it up to something they don't fully own so that they can look good to people who are just in debt like them. lost five people again so here it is mammon makes you feel this way if I had more money I'd help more people the reality is is the level you help people right now is the same level you'll help them when you get more how much more could we do if we stop trying to make God fit into what our greed wants us to have. Imagine how much of a baller you would be if you just went home and cooked. Mammon will make you feel like, no, it's just a little bit. And God is like, I just want you to manage what I've given you because if you manage what I give you well, I will raise up other. Now, this is not this is not a message to say, well, pastor wants me to be poor and sell all my stuff. Pastor don't want me to have no nice things. I'm going to the other church where we can have a fashion show every Sunday. No, what I'm simply saying is, is I've got to ask myself, where does contentment stop in my life? At what point am I crossing over into greed and letting mammon control how I feel? At what point am I going to say to myself, I am satisfied with what the Lord has done in my life. And I know the old saints used to say, if God don't do anything for me, he's already done enough. Well, most of us can't say that because we're in a culture that says, when God does something for you, move on to what God is going to do for you next. And you never get to enjoy what God is doing now because you're so focused on what God is about to do next. So here's a question that must be posed. What does a life of contentment look like for you? second question I want to ask you how has mammon driven your dreams listen when you have resources all having more resources makes you feel like is you can justify why you do what you do and let me help some of you because it's, it's a message not just for you, it's a message for me, it's a question that I have to ask myself internally. And if you grew up poor, I didn't grow up poor, so I'm not gonna give you the story that I grew up poor and all that type of stuff like everybody likes to say to, and then whatever. My parents in our culture were middle class. They started poor and they became middle class, but my parents were very frugal in their, in their, and what we thought was important. So as a kid, what we thought was important was sneakers. They judged you at school based on what you had on your feet. And my parents w would not spend money on Jordans. My parents would take me to get shoes at Payless. And we were so thankful when Shaq came out with some sneakers with, that gave us some name brand life. Remember Shaq had that little shoe with the little basketball that you had to pump on the front? All right, that's only 90s and up, right? And, and so that drives how you view life in the future. Because 
If I see sneakers that I could not buy when I was a kid, I buy them now as an adult, not because I need them, but because I was deprived them as a child. And what many of us are doing, because we've seen, maybe you come out of a lineage of family members that have struggled, and you want to not be that ever. So you're like, because I can, I'm going to make sure I'm never that broke because I've seen it. But in the same token, you got to ask yourself, well, where does contentment start? What drives you to feel that you need to have these things, which is, you got to have that honest conversation. Because there's a lot of sneakers I bought that I don't even like. I just bought it because they had Jordans on them. Because as a child, my parents would say, we are not spending, back then it was a hundred bucks. Now they're like $200. They're, oh, we don't spend a hundred dollars on some sneakers. You won't get the $29.99 special. You won't get the sneakers that leave skid marks on the gym floor. They leave the black mark because they're not good sneakers. They leave a the black mark. But the question that you got to ask yourself is this. When does contentment start? This is not a message to anti-building wealth. It is a message to say, don't be like the character in Luke that says, I'm so rich, I'm going to build me another barn because I'm tired of this barn. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And if we want to be people that are that God can flow through, then we got to have enough disposable income to do what's in our heart. Let me let me give you a deep question. Here's here's a real deep one. So I was sitting down. Now this is not something I'm doing, but this is something that God that I just heard in my thoughts. So God was like, there are some people that have so much resources to justify and prove that God is in their life, they'll go out and buy something, let's say 40,000, a watch that's 40,000 or whatever the case is. And God was like, what would be a greater impact? You going to buy a brand new watch or you adopting a kid? See when mammon, now there's no glorification in adopting children because that's not gonna make you feel like a baller like everybody else. You can't, you can't do this. You, don't, you can't just pick up a kid and be like, yeah, this, this is him. This is he, this is she. So my, my point is, is what can I invest in that's more eternal? Right, then that, that just feeds my own egotistical need. Because you do know as a country, this is not a political statement, it is a true statement. You do know that we live in a country that builds a lot of stuff, but it's trillions of dollars in debt but we are the most prosperous and most successful nation in the world, but have a noose of debt around our neck. And the people are like the same. We are building things that are choking the life out of us because contentment is not enough for us. And I know this is not popular, but it's the truth. God help us all to be more content with what you have given us. Help us to be more content with where you positioned us. And the last point I want to ask you this is this. What do you sense God speaking to you in this message to say to you? What do you sense God is speaking to you? During this message. Because here's the reality church. When mammon is driven and when mammon is driving your peace in your life, enough will never be enough. Amen. 
When mammon is driving your life, enough will never be enough. It's like, yo, I got to get her a bigger ring because, you know, I got to do it. And then after you get the bigger ring, it's like, I got to get a bigger ring because I got to get a bigger ring to outdo the last ring that was bigger. And then after I get the bigger ring, I got to get a bigger backyard because I got to get the kids to be happier in 30, 30 square foot bigger than what I had before. And then after I get this car, I got to get the other car because I really love this car a lot. And then, and then after I get this watch, I got to get another watch because I really like this watch, but I like this watch better. And then after I get this shoe, I got to get this other shoe because this other shoe is much better and complements this other shoe. And I can never appreciate what God does because I'm so committed to trying to get something better than what God has already did. So Matthew, or Mark 8, 36, or Matthew 8, 36 says it like this. What shall it profit you to gain the whole world in the exchange for your soul? I'm not saying don't give your kids what you didn't have. You should. I don't want my kids going to school. I don't want our kids going to school. My kids, my wife and I's kids. I don't, I don't want them having to deal with the pressure of, bro, are those Jordans? How come Michael's holding the ball with his left hand instead of his right? <laughs> like, like, that's stuff I had to worry about. I don't, I, don't, I don't want you to worry about that. So I'm going to make sure you have those things that are not hurdles to you but I need you to learn what contentment is. Because if, if we don't teach our kids contentment at a young age, they will drive us into debt. Mama, how come we don't have this? How come our TV isn't this? How come we don't have that? How come we don't have this? How come we don't have that? Or if you who are doing well financially in your life, you'll raise brats that feel that everything is owed to them. In your efforts to make sure they didn't grow up like you, you raised up tyrants. So the question that we, the, the word that we must use is balance. Don't go too extreme because there was a group of believers, they went so extreme, they said, I want to be poor. I'm going to sell all my stuff just so I can be poor. Um, I'm not doing that. And there was another group that said, I don't ever want to be poor. I'm going to work so hard till poverty never touches my family. That's fine, but not at the expense of what really matters. Hey, bro, I, I, know, I know Thanksgiving's coming, but I, I can't make it because I, 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 I'm about to get this overtime. They're paying me time and a half. So I'm going to miss one time out the year because I'm chasing a bag that will eventually have holes in it. It's balance. That doesn't mean you can't work overtime, but it's balance. I believe I've said what God has asked me to say. The rest is in your care. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for what you said. Thank you for what it is. It's your word. It's not mine. May it help your children be the better. May it help them grow. We know that money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of it. And money is the only thing that you can fall in love with that won't love you back. Money is one of the very few things that you'll fall in love with that won't love you back. So help us to learn what contentment looks like. Help us to be content. In Jesus' name.